And with that, I will introduce tonight's speaker, Tina Lafreniere, Connecting Faces Through Time, How Related Faces Can Help Identify Unknown People and Old Photos. Every day that passes, bits of photographic family history are sold, thrown out, or otherwise discarded because people inherit unlabeled photos and the person who knew who was in the photos has passed. Tina's presentation, Connecting Faces Through Time, How Related Faces Can Help Identify Unknown People in Old Photos, will step you through the features of related faces, address the basics of facial recognition, show you some techniques for making positive identifications and matches, and address how to utilize your cell phone to digitize your old photos. Related Faces is easy and intuitive to use, yet the technology is powerful. Tina's goal for Related Faces is to become a place where people can recapture their family history and reconnect with long lost family members brought together by the faces of their common ancestors. Tina Lafreniere is the founder and CEO of Related Faces Technologies. She's a graduate of the University of Houston where she earned a Bachelor of Business Administration degree in finance. She is a former assistant vice president and production manager for a mortgage brokerage firm in Dallas, Texas. Tina began her genealogical journey over 17 years ago and along the way has inherited thousands of photos from her family, hundreds with no identification. These photos were the inspiration for Related Faces back in 2018 when she conceived the idea for Related Faces and the idea took first place at the Google Techstar Startup Weekend in Fort Myers. Related Faces was launched in February of 22 and was issued a U.S. patent in October of that same year. Tina is a member of the Genealogical Society of Collier County, Florida, the National Genealogical so Society, and the Photo Managers Group. Related Faces is an AWS Activate Entrepreneur Company and a Family Search Registered Solutions Provider. With that, we join me in welcoming Tina. I will stop sharing and let you share. Thank you. I appreciate that. I really appreciate you guys having me. Um, it's a pleasure. I love doing events for Virginia. I've done several now and you guys are a lot of fun and you guys always have great questions. And uh, so let me kind of get into this and I'll give you a little bit of background. I think it's helpful for you to understand where I came from and what my motivation was for creating Related Faces. Well doesn't want to advance. Let's try that again. There we go. So on my dad's side, I'm the product of two large families, the Schlobombs, how's that for a last name, where there were 13 children from two wives who were sisters. One died, then he married the other. And the Foremans, where there were six children who all looked so much alike, especially the girls. And you can see them in the two family photos that are on the right side, the ones in the boxes. From these two families and their descendants, I inherited thousands of photos. Having so many photos is a blessing, but like many of you, I had a problem. My family didn't bother to write the names of the people on the back of hundreds of photos. So just like you, I sat down with my family, magnifying glasses in hand. You can see there's my mom and dad sitting on my dining room table, going through boxes of photo. And we did our best, but for many people's identities, we were just guessing. It was simply nuts. Being the wife of a technology executive, I thought that surely someone had thought of using facial recognition to help solve the problem. But there just wasn't a product out there really designed to deal with unknown dead people. Facebook only works for living people with accounts and Google and Lightroom can do facial recognition against two photos, but they only find faces within a very narrow range. And there was no way to build a profile for my unknown people and no metric to measure the likenesses of the faces. My frustration did lead me to inventing and patenting related faces. Now, very early on, I knew I would have to digitize hundreds of photos. And I looked into various ways but for me, I found those digitizing services and those really cool overhead scanners to be very expensive. So I decided to use my desktop document scanner. And my advice to you is don't make the same mistake that I did. If you look at the three photos boxed in orange, you'll see the results of using document scanners. The duplicate photos 
are actually the same photo. It's of my great grandfather. The one on the left was document scanned in June of 2018. And the one on the right is the same photo from May of 2022. The intense light of the scanner activated the paper and caused the 125 year old photo to fade. This is one of about a dozen photos I managed to ruin that day. Now I now know that some photos taken between 1880 and 1920 may contain elements which when exposed to strong light can begin to fade. The wedding photo is one my cousin digitized on her document scanner. Now document scanners digitize in dots per inch. Facial recognition sees the images as a series of dots or sometimes rectangles. So many times the faces from these photos are not even recognized by facial mapping or these speckled photos generate phantom faces where no face actually exists. As you can see, I needed a better solution. And my daughter suggested the perfect one. And she's young. She knows how to use all this fancy stuff. But what she told me to do was really simple. She told me to use my cell phone. And I now digitize all of my photos with my smartphone by simply taking a picture of my picture. And the results are perfect for this technology. I figured out that having my light source from the side rather than from above, bounces most of the glare away from my camera. I use a cookbook stand to prop my photos upright, which both frees my hands, but it also helps with shadow and glare. I also switch out different fabrics behind the photo, which helps to bring out contrast, which is very important for facial recognition. Also, use the zoom on your camera to get closer in on the faces. Making the faces nice and big will give you better results. So you may want to have two digitized versions, one of the whole photo and one for facial recognition where you get closer in on the faces. Also, I love using my phone because it goes everywhere with me, like to my cousin's house, to my aunt's house. And so I can log into related faces and directly load photos into the platform right from my smartphone. If you don't have, they don't want to use your smartphone, a digital camera really works well too. Now I'm often asked how facial recognition works and regardless of the recognition platform, the concept for the technology is basically the same. Computer algorithms are trained to geometrically map faces by finding points of contrast on faces indicating the location and shape of features such as eyes and nose and mouth. Measurements are made between the points. The more points the application is able to identify, the more measurements it can make and the more accurate the results. The facial recognition platform is finding these points of contrast within the digitized code of the picture. Now, it's not like you or me looking at a picture to find the corner of an eye. The platform is programmed as to what a digitized eye should look like. So the quality of the photo matters. The graphics in orange are, are boxed in orange is a photo of Sylvester Stallone that has gone through facial recognition mapping. Now look at the concentration of points around the eyes, nose and mouth. These are the features that most distinguish one face from another. Now, fun fact, for most people, the eyes will experience the least amount of change across their lifetime. So the better the quality of the image of the eyes, the better the results. After the face is mapped, these programs look for faces with the same or similar readings. The last graphic depicts facial mapping when a person is in profile. So obviously, the less of the face that is visible, the fewer points and measurements we can use for identification. So what happens when an image is poor quality? Like faces in profile, image quality affects the number of points we're able to map on a face. What I'd like you to notice about the quality difference between these two images. So if you're just looking at the two photos on the left, you might think that they're both of equal quality. But when I enlarged the faces, it becomes evident that they're not. 
The photo in the upper left, my cousin digitized on her desktop document scanner at 600 DPI. The photo of the two girls was digitized by my cell phone. My cell phone's camera has a resolution of 12.6 million pixels, which is infinitely better for accurately mapping a face. Pixels allow you to have more than one color where a where a dots per inch, one of the dots, it has to be the same color throughout the entire dot. So that affects the resolution also. The ability for facial recognition to correctly map the face on the right is far superior to the face on the left. With the face on the left, excuse me, I apologize. There you go. Um, with the face on the left, it's hard to define where the corner of the eye is and exactly what the shape of her mouth is. When the technology is only able to identify a portion of the points on the face, it can lead to possible misidentifications. So zoom in on the faces in the photos you've already digitized and check the quality. You may want to digitize them again. If you want to learn more about this, you can go to the Related Faces YouTube page, and I have a 15-minute video where I go over this information in greater detail, and I show you some examples. Now, before you load any photos into Related Faces, I do recommend pulling out the photos where you do know who the people are. These are the photos you're going to want to load in first. The reason is, these people become the target people you're looking for in your unknown photos. We've discovered that the majority of unknown people in photos are actually known people, but they just weren't recognized. Now, having a date range for your photos can really assist in, in identifying the inhabitants. Here's a really fast hack for grouping your photos by date range. Just flip your photos over and sort them by paper type. Making stacks of the thick cardboard photos and the, the embossed ones versus the non-embossed ones. The thin waxy papers glued to the cardboard, so those cabinet cards. And the postcard back papers and the fringe ed papers, ed edged papers and the modern Polaroids and so on. This method is usually ends up doing a pretty good job of sorting your photos into 10 to 20 year groupings. Now, if your photos are currently grouped by family, do this within the family grouping. Don't mix up your photos because that family grouping is very important and you want to maintain it. Okay. Now, after you have your piles of photos that are similar, then you can flip them over and really start dating them. Dating the paper of your photo alone can help you identify the people in your photo. Different types of paper can identify a year range, and that knowledge can help you decide if a photo may be of your grandfather or your great-grandfather when they are at about the same age. Here's some sites that I found useful. The Northeast Document Conservation Center is where I discovered I have those light-sensitive papers. And it has loads of really good information about all kinds of photos. The clothing fashions of the people in the photos and whether they're holding a prop such as a Bible can also help you date the photo. Also look for commonalities in your photos. Does the same backdrop, chair, or other prop appear in more than one of your photos? Also check to see if you have multiple photos taken by the same photographer. This can indicate which side of your family the photo's from. Now the handout I've included includes these as well as some from Becky Adamson. Now she's a research specialist at Family Search. I found that her knowledge of analyzing physical photos to be a big help. And I was also pleased to learn that she uses related faces as a tool when trying to identify some of her people in her photos. Now, this is a whole workshop in and of itself. And so you guys are really interested in this. I think that that's something that you guys might want to do. Becky would be a really great person. I mean, I do have some some knowledge on this and I do include it in my workshop, but, but this is really a specialized area that is really interesting and can help you a lot. 
So related faces is a relatively new genealogy tool and not everyone knows about us. So before I jump into examples of photo mysteries that we've solved, I'd like to give you an idea of how it operates. It shows the same or similar faces, allows you to create profiles for your people, even unknown people, organize your photos and people profiles, allows you to collaborate with others and load photos directly from your mobile device. The results can be pretty straightforward and clearly point to a particular person. But for some others, we give you information you didn't have before as a new place to direct your search. Now the homepage is where you get started and I highly recommend reading our help document, our top tips and our FAQ to receive some comprehensive instruction on using the site. From the home page is where you'll navigate to other parts of the site, such as uploading photos. We designed the site to be very easy to use, but don't be fooled, the technology behind the scenes is state of the art. The site is ADA compliant for visual uh, contrast and clarity. To upload photos from your computer, simply drag and drop the photo into the marked areas, and you can click on the purple words, upload a photo, if you wanna browse your files. Or you can load photos directly from the browser on your mobile device and load those photos directly from that device to including taking photos from inside the platform and then loading them directly. The only required photo data for your whole photo is to name the photo. Your photo's name is private and it's never shared. Any other data you provide is used to enrich the related faces results and is shared when the people in your photo make pairings with another user's photos. We also auto-rotate your photos if they're sideways, but if for some reason it doesn't rotate, just click the button that we've provided. We also give you the ability to organize your photos into color-coded boxes, and if you have additional information about your photo that you're willing to share with others, you can enter that into the notes field. After you click upload, we isolate each identifiable face in the photo and allow you to enter any data you know about each person. Now again, no data is required for related faces to work, except that you must either give each person a name. So if you know who they are, you give them a name. Or if you don't know or are unsure of their identity, you label them with a general descriptor. General descriptors using them is important because that's how we know the, per the person is unknown to you. And it allows you to also use descriptive names such as might be Henry or unknown man or woman, second woman on the right. You can use numbers, you can use special characters, but you really need to use those general descriptors. It is located right above the first name blank. You just click on plus general descriptor and those people are the ones that get the special treatment. Now, deceased people's names are shared when pairings are made, but we default living people's data to private. So it's okay to have a photo with a deceased person and a living person. So their, their personal data will not be shared. If you have any uh, military information about your person in the photo, you can also add that to our site. A key to why related faces work so well is that we build a profile for each of your people, whether they are known or unknown to you. Each of the faces shown here represents a separate profile. Each profile is made to hold multiple photos of your person and profiles for those who turn out to be the same person can be merged when matches are made. So you have a general descriptor and you have one where they're already identified. You go, oh, that's the same person. You can just merge those right together. We also give you the ability to organize your people into color-coded photo albums. If you keep your family tree by color, we allow you to change the color of your albums to match that branch of your tree. As a tip, I recommend creating a work in progress album for profiles you think might be the same person. This makes it easier to compare faces side by side and you can easily jump from profile to profile. So you have a identified person over here and then you have maybe three or four um, 
people with general descriptors that you're thinking might be that person, you could put them all in one place and jump back and forth and decide the pairings or look at the pairings and then decide how, how you feel about those pairings and if they're a match. We also store your whole photos on the My Photos page. So you can always see which photos you've loaded. Here you can get organized by creating photo boxes. The difference between albums and boxes is simply albums store individual profiles while boxes store whole photos. Photo boxes are also editable and can be color coded. If you can't locate an item that you're looking for, you can search. All name, box, and album search lists are clickable and will take you directly to the item that you're looking for. If you click on any profile face, you'll enter that profile. Remember, we build a profile for all of your people, whether they are known or unknown. During this presentation, you're gonna see quite a bit of these four ladies. They're the Foreman sisters, my great grandma Matilda and aunts Lillian, Louisa, and Grace. They all look so much alike that we honestly nearly drove ourselves crazy trying to identify who was who. The Foreman sisters are an example of why you wanna load some of those known photos into related faces before you load the unknown people. By loading a few known photos of people like the Foreman sisters, I was able to create target profiles of who I'm hoping to find in my unknown photos. Now, just to clarify, an unknown person is someone that you have no idea who they are, but it can also be someone who you think you know who they are, but you're unsure. And you hope Related Faces can help you narrow it down to a couple of people or even possibly confirm your suspicions as to who it might be. And these are the people that you want to give those general descriptors and not a name. When you're in a profile, you will see that the person's vital information is on the left in the light gray area. You can edit a person's information at any time. A person's profile page will also show you all of the photos you have identified as having that person in them. Inside a profile, there's a lot of really good stuff. Clicking on a photo will open the photo details page where you can find all of the details for a photo. On the right, you will see a, bla a black oval that says my photos and accepted photos. So my photos display what you see now, all of the photos that you loaded with that person in them. The accepted photos will display any photos you accepted from another user through the matching process. So we don't mingle your photos with somebody else's original photos. On the blue bar in the upper right, you'll see pairings. Your people's pairings page is where you will find all of the pairings that your person has made. Pairings show you which faces look the most like the person in your profile. As you can see here, we present the faces that resemble each other in clear side-by-side -side pairings, and we show you their resemblance number below the pairing. We also help you focus your searches. If you look at the top orange arrow just below the blue bar, you'll see four buttons. These buttons allow you to filter those pairings. You can view all of the pairings your, people has, your person has made, but you'll probably want to click on own photos to show only the pairings made with your own general descriptor profiles. For most cases, your own photos are where are most valuable and will be where most of your answers come from. But for some people, your answers may lie with another user. So we also let you filter to see pairings made with other users or pairings made with photos from the US Library of Congress. For closer examination of face, face, photo, and data associated with the photo your person paired with. So I'm talking about the other one from the other user or the other one from in your own collection. You simply click on the pairing and the pairings detail window will open. If you pair with a photo from the Library of Congress, we give you the web address for that photo at the Library of Congress and you need only click on it on that URL in the orange right there as you, that you see, and we'll take you directly to that photo's Library of Congress page so you can do more investigation. 
After you've reviewed the information, you can then decide what you want to do with the pairing. You may decide to do more research on your pairing and want to separate it from other pairings just so that it's in like a separate special place. So just select the uncertain and we will move that pairing to that page. Or if it's not your person, you can decline the pairing and remove it later completely. Or you may decide it's someone else and can make a match with that person by clicking on the someone else button and we give you instructions in our help on how to do that if you have that. That's going to be very rare. Or if the pairing is correct, and then you can just make a match. And when you make a match, use the radio buttons to acquire any information you want from what was made available for that person. Matching also gives you a copy of that photo and the associated photo data. As you start to analyze your pairings and resemblance numbers, you may find that you have made a mistake or you learn new information about your people and that's no problem. We have built in ways for you to fix that. You can always add or change a photo or photo or people data just by clicking the edit button for either of those. And if you misidentify a person, the photo details page allows you to reassign them. So that was a little information on how Related Faces works. So now let me show you how the site helps solve some photo mysteries. So Related Faces is meant to be another tool in your genealogy belt. Sometimes the results are very straightforward, but in most cases, Related Faces gives us a great starting point, point but we still have to do some old-fashioned sleuthing, and that work can lead to multiple mysteries solved, just like dominoes falling, one leading to the next. As I pointed out earlier, in my family, I have the Foreman girls who looked so much alike. And here are just a handful of my many Foreman sister photos. Now, I want to draw your attention to a few. First, the photo of the three girls boxed in orange. Figuring out who was who in this photo was key to how I worked out which sister was which, since the three oldest sisters are in the same photo. Related faces doesn't allow people in the same photo to pair with each other. So any pairings they did make and the associated resemblance numbers should indicate who is who. Also, please notice the two photos under the arrows. We were certain that the two girls on the right in each of the photos were foreman girls, but we were not sure which was which. The other girls were completely unknown to us. <laughs> or so we thought. So how did I figure out who was who? I started by looking at the pairings my people made. As you can see, I had a lot of pairings and a lot of resemblance numbers because my sisters look so much alike. Related faces resemblance numbers are not only the quantified similarity between the two faces, but also takes into account any data provided about the two photos and the people who are paired. When we find commonalities between the data, we push the resemblance number up. When the data is different, we lower it. This assists you in determining if the paired face is or is not your person. We show you the pairings where the resemblance number is 60 or greater for those within your own collection or with pairings that you make from with another user. And we show you the pairings your people make with the Library of Congress with a resemblance score of 75 or greater. This enables you to capture pairings with family members who may look a lot like your person, such as siblings, as shown by the pairings in the orange circles. My girls, my foreman girls, paired with each other often and at very high levels. But we also allow you to see parents, such as mothers and daughters or fathers and son, as shown by the teal circles. But it also allows you to capture pairings of that person at different stages in their life, as shown by the blue circles. Be aware that a really high resemblance score does not mean that the two faces are the same person. It's a great indicator, but you need to pay attention to what makes sense and look for the differences. The great thing about the resemblance numbers is that they can show you those subtle differences between people especially across multiple pairing sets. And I'm gonna show you an example of that in a second. 
Also, a lower resemblance number doesn't mean that it's not your target person. Photo quality, face angle, and a difference in age can all affect the score. So again, you're looking for what makes sense. Next is an easy way to organize and analyze the resemblance numbers to help you make accurate identifications when you have multiple people who all look so much alike. So I use a chart to compare and see what makes sense. So by replacing the resemblance numbers in cells corresponding to the pairings made between my identified photos of people and my unidentified photos, I could discern who my many people in my photos were. Now, for an example, the resemblance number between the top row known photo of Matilda on the, on the row on the left, start with her, and the girl in column A is 99.77. But Matilda paired with every girl in that photo. The next girl was 91.18, and the next sister is 84.86, and so on. So if I was looking at these individually and not in a graph, I might miss that. Where there are blanks on this page, no pairings were made. On the left side, you see I position the photos where I do know which sisters which they are identified. And each photo has its own row. Across the top are the unnamed photos where I gave the girls general descriptors. Here I gave each girl in each photo, their own column and letter identifier. On the top left, you will see that photo containing the three older sisters. Since all three of the sisters are in the same photo, the sister with the highest resemblance score with a known named photo is likely to be that sister. And the results prove that to be true. I mean, this is just going back to kind of like math class, you know, where we all made those graphs. So please look at the top row sister, Matilda. As you can see from the resemblance number, Matilda paired the highest with the sister on the left in the photo with all three. The other two sisters also paired highly with Matilda, but the resemblance numbers indicate that the first sister is Matilda. Now, if you look at the rows for Louisa, you'll see that the sister on the right very clearly paired the highest with Louisa. Then if you look at the rows for Lillian, you'll see similar results for her with the sister in the middle. So after related faces indicated who was who in the photo with the three oldest sisters, I went about comparing those faces and the other photos where they were known to the rest of my unknown photos. So if you look at the next three photos of the four girls dressed in white, I used a similar method with these. It wasn't until I laid out my many suspected Foreman photos side by side that I realized I had confirmation photos for all four girls. I originally thought that girls D and E were both the same girl when I was just kind of flipping through them one by one. But as you can see, girl E paired extremely highly with Lillian and the clothing styles in the two photos are very different. Lillian was confirmed in 1896, and the dress style in photo E is from that time, which confirms the results from related faces that girl E was indeed Lillian. From the church records where I discovered Lillian's confirmation, I also found that Matilda and Louisa were in the same confirmation class. That told me that the photo of the two girls F and G must be Matilda and Louisa, but I still had to figure out who was who. Excuse me, I think I went a little too fast. There we go. By process of elimination, girl D must be Grace, the youngest, even though the blurry image of the child Grace did not pair with the older photo of herself. I did research the clothing from 1915 when she was confirmed and girl D's clothing is from that time period. Also note that girl D and Grace each have a bow in their hair where none of the other sisters does. Hair bows were very popular during that time. The blocks marked in orange indicate that the image of Lillian and the image of Grace are from the same photo. It shows the age difference between the oldest and youngest sisters, 
and further shows that the youngest Grace is most likely to be the girl from the photo from the 19 teens. Related faces figured out Matilda and Louisa for me. As you can see, the resemblance numbers return by comparing the confirmation photos to the known photos of Matilda and Louisa told me who was who. To confirm my findings, I also compared my unknown photos against each other. I wanted to see, did the unknown photos point to the same person? So, and I included that one of the photos that has the three older sisters in it. So looking at the chart on the right, you'll see that resemblance numbers derive from comparing the unknown photos against themselves, against the unknown photos, to try to confirm those, those, chart, those findings from the other chart. Now, if you look, these, look at the green squares inside of those orange boxes, and you can see that these confirm that those are Lillian. And then these green scores inside these orange boxes confirm that these people are Lillian. And then these confirm Louisa. And we know that Grace looks the most like Lillian, but process of elimination leaves us with the last one being Grace. But here's a little update on Grace. I was looking through some of my, one of my old folders from way back. And I actually found a digitized copy I had forgotten I had that showed Grace as an adult with her family. And the photo file was quite small. It was only 25K. But as you can see, I have now paired Girl D with a known photo of Grace and confirmed her identity. Now, let's move on to photo I. And you will see my dominoes were really starting to fall. If you look at Lillian's confirmation photo, and photo I with the tasseled backdrop. Related faces returned a resemblance number of 99.99 between the two faces. And that's fantastic. And that does not happen that often. And her wedding photo returned a score of 98.44. I have now identified another photo with Lillian. But who's the other girl? I honestly thought I would never know. But the answer came when actually when I was doing a search on Lillian's brother, Arthur. Now, about six or seven years ago, I was looking for community books on Porter County, Indiana, and the book on the left was on Amazon, and there wasn't a blow up of the cover. It was just a tiny thumbnail, but one teeny tiny face jumped out at me, the face boxed in teal. I was convinced this was my uncle Arthur, so I gladly bought the book, expecting that the inside of the book would have a list of the people on the cover. But no, there was nothing written about the photo at all. So I stuck it on my shelf and there it sat until I created related faces. And of course, I couldn't wait to check and see if I was correct. And related faces confirmed for me that I was with a score of 99.74. And I thought, how cool is that? My uncle is on a book cover. So then one day I laid the book down on my desk face down and I went to eat some lunch. And when I came back and went to pick up the book, I noticed the girl on the back and I thought she looked very familiar. So I took out my cell phone and I zoomed in on her face and I loaded it into Related Faces. I actually loaded it into our test platform. And I want to point this out right now. I want to pause. Books can have copyright. Okay. And so you want to make sure that you have permission to use the photos. This photo I have learned, you'll learn on the next slide was in the public domain. So let's go ahead and I'm going to show you what happened. She immediately made a pairing and look who she paired with. She was sitting, she's the girl sitting next to Aunt Lillian. Now I was pretty excited, but I'm a good genealogist. I needed to confirm my findings. Plus I still didn't know her name. So I reached out to the Portage Township Community Historical Society and Kathy Heckman kindly located the photo and sent me the names of the people. And there was my uncle, Arthur Foreman, so we were correct, and a woman named Delma Nicholson Booman. Now I had two more photos mystery solved. Well, sort of. I still couldn't figure out how Delma Nicholson Booman was connected to me, but the name Booman was really sticking in my brain that I knew it from somewhere. 
So I had been looking on the foreman side of my tree, but I decided to go ahead as since I didn't find her and research Delma. And I found Delma on a 1930 census married to an Emil Booman. So great. Then I searched for Emil and I found him 20 years earlier living with his parents and siblings. And it was bam. It was like all of a sudden his brother Alfred's name jogged my memory. So I jumped over to my tree. I'd been looking on the foreman side, which was wrong. And I switched and I started looking on the Schlobaum side of my tree. Now, let me describe. At the top is Henry Sr. with his first wife, Eleanor. Their oldest daughter, Anna, is on the left on that second generation line. And on the right side of that line are my great grandparents, Henry Schlobaum and Matilda Foreman. Now, I'm in the lower right. If we go one more generation down from Anna, you'll see her daughter, Edna, is married to Alfred Booman. So that's where I knew the name from. In the lower left is an insert showing Alfred and his siblings, and Emil is married to Delma Nicholson Booman. So Delma Booman, a girl I had no idea who she was, and I never thought I would, turned out to be connected to me not once, but twice from both sides of my family, from my great-grandma Matilda's sister's friend, and on my Schlobaum side of the family, she is my great aunt's daughter's mail and shirt tail relative, but she's still important to me. And I also learned as I was doing research on this, that my great grandfather, Henry Schlobaum was the godfather to Johann Boomen. So it's amazing how this one photo helped me grow my family tree and it expanded my fan club like crazy. I didn't realize the Boomins were so important to my family. So there's one more domino. Now, one day I was loading this photo of Uncle Bill Schlobaum, Aunt Minnie, and their first son, Fred. I already had a profile built for Uncle Bill from that big fam Schlobaum family photo, but I had to enter all of Aunt Minnie and Fred's data. So when I was finished loading the photo, I was surprised to see Aunt Minnie had a pairing. When I clicked on the pairing page, you could have pushed me over. I was stunned to see that Aunt Minnie was great grandma Matilda's friend from photo H. Our family had no idea they were apparently best friends. Matilda died in 1912 from TB and Minnie died in 1929. So the fact that the two friends married brothers was lost to us until related faces made this match. By identifying these two women who are part of my fan club, and having been able to enrich the stories of my great grandparents who tragically died too young, they were leave, they left my grandfather an orphan by the age nine. So there are other matches that were made with these photos, but please now let me pivot. So while I was at the NGS conference in 2022, I met the nicest lady named De Denise Griggs, and some of you may know her. She is also an author. Now, Denise asked me a really good question. Can related faces tell the difference between identical twins? And at the time, I actually wasn't sure. We, I didn't know any identical twins. And as it turned out, Denise is an identical twin. And she very generously brought us photos to use as a test. So the results actually made us cheer right there in the exhibit hall. Related faces was able to correctly identify Denise's sister in all the pairings. For Denise, we had some mixed results. In one case seen here in the top right, Denise paired better with her sister than with herself. But Denise said she thinks that may have been because she was making a face in the photo. You will look. You will also notice uh, that where the orange oval is, Denise paired with herself only 0.01% higher than she paired with her sister in the photos. So we must still use our genealogy skills in looking for details, like, but the resemblance numbers are there to help us discern those differences. Denise pointed out that her sister has a very slight underbite where she does not. And it's clear that Related Faces was able to discern this difference and correctly identify Denise's sister in every photo. Now you may wonder how quickly the system works. This is Andre Kearns, and some of you may know him, especially those of you that live in the DC area. 
He asked us to help him determine if an unknown photo he has is an additional photo of his great-grandfather, James Richards. He believed that the unknown man was also his grandfather, but other members of his family didn't think so. It took less than five minutes to enter the three photos and all of about five seconds to get the pairing results. Related faces return a very strong resemblance score of 99.82. Now, making pairings with your own photos may happen within minutes or even seconds, but keep in mind that every time a new photo is entered, all of the pairings are refreshed. This means that you may enter a photo today and have no pairings, but months or years from now, someone may just load a photo of that one person you've been unable to identify and your photo mystery could be solved. And we really appreciate Denise and Andre for giving us permission to share their stories with you. Now, I'd like to touch a little more on the Library of Congress photos. We have tens of thousands of photos from the Library of Congress, which were suitable for facial recognition, and those are in our platform. Many Library of Congress photos are poor quality and very low resolution. And you may find that your people make a large number of pairings and probably errant pairings with these photos, especially those of children. Remember what I showed you earlier about low quality photos? It affects the results. Now as to why children's faces make so many pairings, we learned that children's faces do not start taking on their final adult features until between the ages of eight and 14. So their faces really do look a lot alike and they have similar measurements. Therefore, children pair very easily with other children and some adults too. So you want to think about that children readily pair with other children. So you're gonna to want to try to find them when they have features that are more similar to the way that they're going to look. So if you have those children photos, I really recommend sticking to the ones that are like above like age eight or 10. If you have a baby, you are going to probably make a pairing with the, your other baby. You have a second baby photo of that person, but you're going to get a lot of babies just because their heads are about the same size. Their eyes are about the same size in the same place. And it doesn't matter the ethnicity. They're all similar. So why did we decide to add them to our collection? Because for so many people, this collection opens up new possibilities. The collection also includes many Native, Asian, and African-American photos, as well as Civil War and Depression-era photos. I have personally found that three of the foremen women, Lillian, Grace, and their mother, Mil Wilhelmina, all pair with one particular photo at the Library of Congress. Since this is a side of my family where I have some brick walls, I have started investigating the origins of this photo because I'm hoping it's an unknown ancestor of mine. So now what do you do when you think you only have one image or maybe you only have one image of a person and you don't know who they are? So this example is actually the first photo mystery we ever solved with related faces when we were still testing the technology. The photo on the far left is a photo my cousin owns. We wondered if it could be a photo of our two times great grandparents and their first three children. Our two times great grandmother Eleanor died during childbirth and our great grandfather Henry Senior ended up marrying her sister. The family photo is of Henry's family with Eleanor's sister, Angelina, and 12 of the 13 surviving children from both wives. Our test paired the two men in these photos. But could we prove the woman in blue, in the blue oval there, was, was Eleanor? And here's what we looked at, and here are some things that you can look for in your photos. First, can you identify someone else in the photo? And we had a good match for Henry. Does the photo and the clothing in the photo fit the time period that the people lived? And our photo and our clothing fit the 1870s, which is when our children were born. Can you match the birth order and gender of the children in the photo to your family? Ours match the order of the first three born, a girl, a girl, and a boy. And a boy. In the original, I know it's hard to tell in this one, but the, the small child's hair is cut. Now in our family, it's Anna, then Catherine, then William. 
Now, does your known person make related faces pairings with other family members? Our suspected grandmother also made a good number of familial pairings. And this was really kind of the key. She paired with three of Ellen Nora's children, Anna, the firstborn, Kate, the second board, and my great grandfather, Henry Jr. But the thing that really sealed our belief that this is the only known photo of Eleanor is that she makes pairing with three of the daughters of her sister and her husband. So it's Ida, Emma, and Laura. So there's a very strong genetic code. The children are not just half siblings. These children are more than that because their mothers were sisters. Now, circumstantial evidence can be very powerful when you don't have a second image for your person. You're looking for things that fit, things that make sense. In our case, an additional piece of evidence is that my cousin is descended from Anna, the oldest child. So it makes sense that she would have inherited the photo. It would have been handed down. It actually was handed down from mother to daughter, mother to daughter, and mother to daughter. So now, please excuse how crowded this slide is going to get. I did it because I want to illustrate how a single family group photo can be immensely valuable. Because most of the time, it's those family photos where people know who their grandparent is. So you know who the people in the large family photos are. At least a lot of the times. I know there's some families that don't. But a lot of the times, that's where... You can get those faces, those identified faces. Now, I only have a few large family photos, but they have been amazing for helping me solve my photo mysteries, especially my anonymous brides. So this Schlobaum family photo, boxed in blue, taken around 1912, when put into related faces, helped me identify four of my unknown brides. They're, they were unlabeled wedding photos. The first one that I identified was Kate, then Laura, then it went to Alvina, and the last one was Ida. Sorry about the delay. I don't know why this is going so slow. So that is great, but figuring out who the brides are actually gave me so much more. So once the brides were revealed, then I knew by association, what their husbands look like, and I could add their images to my family tree. In the case of Ida and Alvina, their photos included their wedding parties, and the church records told me the names of their attendants. In Ida's photo, related faces identified Louisa Foreman, Arthur Foreman, and Theodore Schlobaum. By process of elimination, that left the final person to be Gertrude Robbins. In Alvita's wedding photo, related faces identified George, Theodore, and Emma Schlobaum. And that only left Eleanor Sonicson again, to be identified by process of elimination. So all of these additional people were identified simply because I was able to identify the brides in the photo. Then I could associate the brides to other people in the photo. Related faces was able to further positively identify more people and the church records backed up the findings and helped us identify the remaining. Also by identifying whose wedding photos these are and learning the names of the attendants, I've learned who were the most important people to my relatives. I've identified the most likely candidates in their fan club and who should I should further research to gain additional information about my relatives. When you're trying to make decisions, you're going to want to look closely at each face. And here's a few tips on what I look for. First, I look at the eyes and the eyebrows. In these photos of James, you can see key similarities in his eyes. You see the way his lid folds over itself and forms a shaded area in the corners? And his eyebrows are also the same shape between the two photos. There's a sharp turn down over after the brow passes over the iris. You can see it just goes. Is that a hand for this? Or... Lips are also a great item to study. In this case, James's lips have a distinctive, tiny yet peaked bow, 
and a little pucker between the peaks, and that's very evident in both photos. The lower lip also has the overall same shape. Now turning to the women on the right, the woman on the top is Eleanor from before, and I was hoping that one of the other two photos might prove to be an additional photo of her, but related faces did not pair any of these women together. Now, upon closer examination of the eyes and brows, it becomes evident they're not the same woman. The woman on the lower left has a brow that starts low and near the inside corner of the eye and then only slightly arches over the eye. The woman on the right has a very thin and high arching brow. Also, her eyelids cut across the top of her iris where Eleanor's eyes are very round in shape. Also, the woman on the left has on a on Edwardian style clothing, so she can't be Eleanor, as Eleanor died in 1881. Now, you'll also want to look for family traits. In my family, we have a very interesting trait that came down through those foremans. Our eyebrows are very short, especially the one on the right. And I don't know if you guys can see me, but I have teeny tiny little eyebrows. Now, you can see that that trait was handed down from my three times great-grandmother, Caroline, through the Foreman girls and from their mom, Minnie, onto my dad and his sister, and onto my sister, my daughter, and me. Now, you'll also see that Matilda passed on her nose to me and my sister, and my dad inherited Lillian's and Grace's thinner nose. These are the kinds of details facial analysis picks up on and shows up in those resemblance numbers. But you want to use what you know about your family to make the final decisions as to if it is or is not your person. Related faces is a great tool, but we leave the decisions to you. So in September of 2021, I was finally able to go to Sweden to meet in person my long lost cousin, Johanna, and the rest of my Swedish family. Johanna is just as crazy about preserving family photos history as I am. So we set out to digitize as many photo albums owned by our elderly cousins as we possibly could. Now in Sweden, they have this thing called Fika. It's a coffee break and everybody does it. So she would call them up and say, oh, I'm bringing the American and we're going to Fika. And so they have to bring out the photo album. So as she's Fika and talking to them, I'm digitizing the photos like crazy. And we successfully digitized eight albums containing hundreds of photos. But here's the really interesting part. While I'm going through the photos, I found more than a dozen photos in Sweden that are the same exact photo that I have or are came out of the same photo series. Like somebody took a bunch and then they pulled one out and sent it to Sweden. But here's the crazy part. Every photo in Sweden had identifying information on the back where mine were blank. They had nothing. And here's just three of them. So I'm going to use this one right here. Well, first of all, let me tell you who the culprit was. The woman in the middle here, this is Hannah. She is my great grandmother. Hannah sent these photos back to her dead husband's family. She sent pictures back of my brother from the 1960s. That's more than 30 years after he passed. And she had the writing on the back. Now, this one's written in Swedish, but it told me who was in it, and I didn't know. I suspected this man right here, the, the third man from the left, or yeah, the third man from the left. I thought he was my great-grandfather, Gustav, but I wasn't sure. But it says, from left, Edwin Nicholson, Arvid Nicholson, Gustav Berenson, it tells me he lives in the USA, and Conrad Nicholson. And then it also tells me taken in the USA in 1928. So the photos ended up telling me answers that I didn't have. And the photo over here on the right was really cool because I knew this was my mom and her sister. I didn't know when it was taken. But it says here that she was five and a half and she was 16 months. And my mother couldn't remember in my photo over here. But when I said it was taken in September of 1948, suddenly her memory jogged and she went, oh, that was my first day of kindergarten. So now I have a whole story that goes with that photo. So your photo mysteries may be on another continent or in another state.
You just never know. So we're almost finished here. The last thing I want to point out is that I have shown you how you can identify unknown people by associating them with other known people. But let's be honest, the easiest way to identify a known person is to pair them with an already identified photo. You need to think broadly about where you might find your photos of your family. I have found family photos on book covers, in school photos, in the local library, and there's even a separate section on the Portage Community Historical Society website dedicated to three of my families. My family members, both at home and abroad, have also supplied identifying photos, and I've been able to help them with their un unidentified photos. A lesser known place to find photos is on gravestones. Putting photos on gravestones is most popular in Europe, but you can also find them in graveyards around the world. Most of the stones with photos are post 1900. Now, as a reminder, please do remember that you must have the right to use the photos before you load them. Please don't lift any photos off of any site, off out of any books without permission to use them. We do have a digital media statement that says, if you load the photo in there and somebody else identifies it and says it's their photo, then we have a conflict. If you want to watermark your photos that you put, you own it, you know you have the rights to it, go right ahead. Just make sure you don't put anything across the faces because that will hinder the facial mapping and the facial recognition process. So it's my goal to grow related faces into a tool used by genealogists across the world. My dream is that families divided by continents and times can be brought back together by their shared photos. For those people who are uncomfortable about taking a DNA test, I hope that related faces is an avenue for them to find their families via the faces of their shared ancestors and some state-of-the-art technology. So thank you for your time and allowing me to show you how Related Faces works and how you can use it to solve your photo mysteries. Your people won't always make the pairings you expect, and sometimes it's frustrating, just like with document searches. I can't make guarantees, but I have found that being persistent and sometimes adding just one more photo can bring about the most wonderful and exciting results. If you're interested, I'm giving you all a discount off of your first subscription in addition to the free trial period. And the code is actually in your handout, as well as some examples from this presentation and some of them that aren't in here. So thank you very much. And if you guys have questions, I am happy to answer them for, for you. We do have one question. I'm going to suggest you put that last slide back up because the um, discount is slightly different. It is the different. Yeah. Is different than that's why that's up in the handout. I, it is. Use the one that's in your handout. Okay. This is this is one that I reuse, and all of a sudden I went, "Oh wait, I forgot to change that." Was why I kind of got off of it really quick. <laughs> okay. It's different. Was... <laughs> Use the one in your handout because this is the one for, that I did um, last Saturday. Okay. Oh, I apologize. They got a better discount than we yeah. did by three oh, no. percent. I'm just being no, silly. No. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm wrong. No, 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 I'm wrong. This actually is the discount we had last year. Sorry, we did a we did a discount for genealogy or the genealogy bargain site, and we gave that last year as a special three percent. I, I see. <laughs> okay. No, it was it was a special a special deal and. Okay. Last year. And we're, we're not offering that one. It was something that <laughs> genealogy bargains came to us and asked us if we would do a special deal for them. So we did. Okay. Sandy, I see your hand raised, but I'm going to get the question in the chat box first and then I'll come to you. Okay. All right. Um, your AI matching routines seem very similar to DNA studies. The terms and conditions for most DNA companies these days allow you to control the use of your DNA sample. You can give permission or not for, to the retention of your sample for particular purposes, such as use for by law enforcement. If I read your terms and conditions correctly, once we have entered the photos with you, you obtain all decisions on use of that image. So we do not have rights uh, rights to determine the uses of the image. Even if we drop our membership, you retain the rights to the image. Is that correct? That is correct. And here I will tell you why that is correct. Because this is a sharing site. And so if you load the, the photo up, 
and another user helps you solve your photo mystery. So they have your unknown person and then you get your photo mysteries solved, but they have not been able to make the match and share. We share photos across the site. So if you make a match, you get a copy of their photo. And if they make a match, they get a copy. So if you get a copy and then you take yours down before they get a copy, that's not fair to them. So this is a sharing site and the photos are put in and they are retained so because of that purpose. Okay. That is, that is why, because the, it's like a neural network that's, that is built. Once you put the photo in there, we start associating them. We associate the data and that is how we make the matches. So I know that that there, some people are going to be uncomfortable with that and I'm sorry, but that is how the technology is working. And that is, is how, how it works. I, you know, I don't know how to explain it any other way, but yes, okay. we, we do. Now we don't, we don't take claim to your original. We don't sell it. Nobody outside of our users have the ability to see it or to access it. Uh, that Google cannot come in and search through our database. Um, be, no, none of the search engines can enter into our database. Only the people who pay and who are users within our database. If And they have to make a pairing with your face to see it. And it has to meet that 60% uh, minimum level that I told you about. That they have to, their person has to look at least 60% like your person to even see the parry. So hopefully that makes you feel a little bit better. Okay. Sandy? You have yeah. to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi. I, I have a question when you're talking about using iPhones for yeah. digitizing. Yes, ma'am. What is the minimum iPhone that you would use? And is it, I would assume, best to maybe borrow a friend's iPhone 16 or whatever they're <laughs> up to now? Well, yeah, they're pretty, those are pretty awesome. The one I have is a 12, but when I started, I had an eight. And so a lot of my photos that are digitized were actually done with an eight and they were very good. So, and I think the eight had a 10 megapixel camera an eight or a 10 megapixel camera, which was really good. This has 12.6, so it's 12 million, 600,000, whatever, 12.6 million pixels in your 12. So, and then the newest ones are even better than that. I understand that there is a, a Google phone out there that has a 200 million pixel camera. I heard that the other day. I haven't seen it, but I that's pretty stunning to me. I Well, I shouldn't say that. I haven't seen the results of it. The man had, I was at a, a, a event in Georgia and he had one and it literally had five lenses. It was crazy. It was amazing. And so just I, would, of, I would say an eight, you, if you have an eight or, or higher, you should be okay. And just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. I, I know our family history center has these um, machines that you can just put photos in and you, we can get them digitized seven times as fast or yep. 10, 20 times. Yep. Is, that, do, I, is there some way we should ask what they're digitizing pixels to and yes. whether it's worth doing that? Yes. So let me explain just a little bit about those because I ha I am not going to poo-poo that technology. So here's what I'm, I'm, I am going to say. If they say this digitizes in dots per inch, 300, 600, 800, I would say you're going to end up with that face like I showed you of Delma, where she had all her face was just a bunch of squares. You get up to 1,200 dots per inch. It's a little bit better, but you still have each dot can only be a single color where pixels are not limited to that rule. They can have multicolors. That's why their definition is better. But if you've got one of those scan stamps, those those really those ones with the overhead, those are really cool. And I believe those digitize in pixels, but that's the key, dots per inch versus pixels. Also, the ones that do multiple photos at a time are great, but I would avoid it. And this is why you want the faces nice and big so that we can map all those details so you can see the whites of the eyes right that's really important 
for facial recognition. When you put down six or four photos, you've now divided your 12.6 million pixels into smaller segments where if you do it one at a time and you can use the zoom feature, you can actually crop out for the, for your facial recognition version, crop out, crop out the skirt. We don't care. Crop out the backdrop. We don't care. Get in on the faces and make them really big and you will be so much happier with the results. So I would just do them one at a time. You can use I know that a lot of people have photo mine and they love it because they can just use that and it'll scan and it'll put it up to the cloud for them. And that's great, but I'd still do them one at a time. I wouldn't do multiple ones because it just limits the size that your faces can be. Does that answer your question, Sandy? Yep. Thanks. Okay. Does your program ID uh, period uh, of clothing? Uh, we do not do clothing at this time. We do strictly facial recognition on that. The clothing, um, like I said, that is a whole area that is really cool. And and Paula, I really recommend if you can. I was so impressed by Becky Adamson from Family Search. She was at NGS in Richmond and she had a class and it was great. And so I recommend her for that. Cool. Thank you. This is very interesting and exciting. Um, what is the website address for Related Faces? Relatedfaces.com. That's just Very too easy. easy. Too easy. <laughs> Simple. Don awesome. says that the, the Samsung ahead. Galaxy S23 Ultra has a 200 megapixel camera. There you go. I knew, I knew, I, I knew it. The guy showed it to me. I didn't see the picture, but he was, he was showing it to me this week. And I was like, that is so cool. <laughs> um, now I was going to just say one more thing and it just went Right out of I'm my sorry, mind. I interrupted you. No, Do you no, want me no, to go no. back to the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, what was the question? Me, uh, question before. Oh, just what was the website, and then a oh, period of clothing. I think is is what we were discussing before that. Um, no, it had to do with the website address. What was I going to tell you about the? Oh, I remember. So sometimes you're going to get on there, and you're going to need help, right? I monitor personally. Our contact us. At the bottom of our website, or it doesn't matter if you're on the unauthenticated page or you're inside your user, at the bottom it says contact us. If you have a question, you can click on that and it will have a little form and you fill it out. I usually am very good about getting back to somebody within just, well, usually I do it pretty immediately because it alerts my phone. But if I'm in something and I can't, usually I get back within the same day somebody. You can also, if it's not an emergency, you can also send me an email at customer service at relatedfaces.com. And I answer those also personally. I don't want you to be frustrated. I want you to be happy. I want you to, to get the most that you can out of it. If you get into the program and there's something that you just don't understand, let me know. I have set up web calls with customers and I just send you a Microsoft Teams link and we get on there and you share your screen and we figure out whatever the issue is that you might be having. Okay. okay. Next question. Do you have the capability to do old photos like tintypes, which sometimes yeah. are completely black, but can still be extracted on the initial scan? Yes. And I, that's a really good question. And I want to show you something if I can, I'm going to share my screen. I have another presentation. So give me just a second to call it up. This is one I just developed and um, it's some new information that I want to show you. Um, okay, so let me share my screen. And I need to scroll through here and get to... This is a lot the same. Okay. So what I want to show you, this is this applies kind of the, to the tin types too. Something that was figured out fairly early, fairly early on during um, the development of facial recognition is facial recognition does have a more difficult time with darker tones than lighter tones. Okay, and that applies to skin also, and it has to do with the way that digital cameras interpret color. So white is interpreted as the absence of color, as zero. There's literally no data. 
So as the algorithm's going through and it's reading, it comes across the data, uh, like very slight data. And this happens to be, this is me on the left when I was little. I, I put color in my hair. I actually have white hair. I was born without pigmentation in my hair. And so if my mother loved to dress me in white. And then you put me against a white background and then I fade. You can see there's very little contrast. And contrast is how facial recognition reads the face and how it determines where the points are, where there's a color change, a tone change. All right. So the photos on the right are obviously have the same problem, but the different aspect. Black or dark colors are fully saturated. It's a lot of data. So where you have no data and suddenly then there is data, it's easy to find that point of contrast. When you have a lot of data and suddenly there's just a little bit less data, it's really hard to find that. Now, the facial recognition today is not the facial recognition of 15 years ago. They've done so much improvement. It's really, really good. But this also applies to the tin types, which you might want to do is sometimes those tin types, they fade to kind of this purpley blue, right? So you digitize them, take a picture with your cell phone, try to make sure there's no glare across the face. But you're going to want to do this. You're going to want to brighten it. All I did to these photos was run them through what's on my computer, the photo editing tool, and I brightened it. I would stay away from highlighting because highlighting actually puts white on there and it might put a, the, the highlighting program may put some highlight or white, not where you, the contrast actually exists. So that would put the point in the wrong place, you know, maybe of the corner of the eye or something. So what you're going to want to do with your tin types, if they are looking like the photos on the left, you're going to want to brighten them just like you would if you are a dark skinned person and you have a dark skinned person in a dark background. Or let's say you have a person who's in shadow and you can kind of see the face. Make a copy of your photo. Put it, you know, use your, your photo editing tools and see if you can brighten it up. See if you can lighten it and get those faces to come out. If it doesn't work, you haven't lost anything. You just delete that copy of a photo. Okay. Does that make sense? Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Tin types. And, and even there's also some. So you remember I had those silver chlorides photos, the ones that faded on me when I put them on the bright light. There's silver bromide. When silver bromide, it can also lighten, but it can also fade to purples and blues. And sometimes you're going to need to do that with those also. So it really depends on the condition. And then you may just have to do restoration. And then that's a whole nother presentation <laughs> that I've got. On, on restoration. If you guys want to know about restoration, I can come back sometime and talk to you about restoration. <laughs> he said he had to use the, the histogram tool for the tintypes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You just, you just got it. You know, I, I have a customer who has several of them and I didn't, I don't personally own any. And so when she told me she had them, she sent them and they worked great. Once we had them, the face is clear. It didn't really matter that the face was kind of a light blue. The facial recognition still mapped it and it still did find her her correct person, but it wasn't like a 99% or a 95%. We were talking that the pairings made in the 80s, which is okay. It made sense to her. She suspected it was the same person and it ended up being the same person because it made sense to her. Okay. Even though it wasn't 99%. Okay. Okay. Has this been used for identifying unidentified deceased persons by law enforcement? No, I do, we do not and have not been approached. We would not be a really good uh, site for them because most of ours is genealogical um, purposes. But in our privacy statement, we do state that they ha would have to come to us with a court order and force us to turn over that. But as of now, I, I I mean, I would see them going to, you know, one of maybe photo mine or somebody before they would come to us because our, ours is genealogically purposed. Okay. What photo editing tool is on your computer? The one you were talking about just, a minute ago. I, I have a Windows and I use the Microsoft uh, one that comes with my Windows machine. That's all I used. Okay. Yeah. 
And that is it. Sandy, I saw your hand go back up, but then go back down. Did you have another question or are you good? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Then that is it. Thank you very, very thank much. You. Thanks for, to everyone for attending. And thank you, Tina, for such a great presentation. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I hope you guys got a lot out of it. So did I understand that there's going to be a YouTube of this? Because yes. you may or may not know this, but you, Tina, ex talk extremely fast <laughs> and throw <laughs> out an extreme amount of information. So I do. And for it will me, be ready it, sometime, uh, probably by, by sometime tomorrow. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. And it's so also many. difficult to follow your handout compared to your slides. So that, it's I was I printed it off real quickly, hoping that I could be taking some notes, but that was a useless task. <laughs> That's because I use I have several different presentations, and I tried to make a handout that kind of covered them all. Because uh, sometimes different ones, like I'm going to be doing a presentation next month that is just slightly different, has a little slightly different information. So I tried to put that in there. And that's why on my handout, there's some written explanations in there. So I tried to, to give you a little bit of an idea on that. But, you know, I am I am here to help and answer questions. Um, and I've given you the contact information. Customer service at relatedfaces.com. Okay, so, thanks. You're welcome. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody. And everyone have a good night. So I have just one other quick question. Sure. Those three sisters in your example that you kept going to, how far apart in ages are they? Like yeah. that's a great question. So it was the first three were born. And so those first three are less than five years apart. The fourth sister was the last one born. There were two boys in the middle. So Arthur and Wilfred were born. So you've got the first three. That's why we have that one photo of the three at the beginning. And Grace is kind of set aside. So she ended up, I don't have very many photos of her, um, but the one that I found, that's how we determined the clothing was just so different. It was Matilda and Louisa that were the problems. They were born 18 months apart and they looked so much like I, we, it made me crazy. Even related faces made a lot of pairings between them. And I had to sit down and I had to say, okay, I have all these pairings. And if I just look at them individually, I could wrongly identify them because they looked like twins. So that's why that chart that I came up with how I did it. I was like, okay, I have to map these out and I have to be able to look at them individually and say, okay, these two pair. Oh, look, this one, this sister pairs higher with this one, just like I showed you. This right. one yep. pairs yep. higher with this one. And that's the way that that sort of developed because they are, they're very close in age. And Louisa and Matilda are, were just look so much alike. Okay. okay. Are we really done this time? <laughs> I am I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. And I, I hope that you guys got, you know, some a lot of information, even if you don't use related faces, I hope you learned a lot about facial recognition and how to digitize your old photos and such. One Thank last you. question. Were the charts manual or software generated? I manually did it. Yeah. So I use Excel. Actually, when I did it the first time I drew it on a piece of paper and, uh, I don't know if that's something, you know, when you own a company and you have, and it's brand new, like there's, there isn't really anything that does this like this out there. So we choose very carefully when we're self, since we're self-funded as to what we do. And I just felt like it was easy enough for you guys to use Excel or to use your own chart to figure out you know, and to place it rather than us spending all those resources. I'd rather develop some more on the facial recognition or maybe add someday, add something about the clothing identification or something along that line someday. But there's a lot of other things that we've, we've got in the works and we have our team development team kind of working on that hopefully will be coming out in, in this next year or so. So, Terrific. And thank, on that you. Note, <laughs> thank you very much. And we will see the rest of you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone.